Hey everyone, welcome back to our podcast. Um, I'm Parthi, founder and CEO of Letter Drop, and today we're talking to uh, Nick Chan um, or Nicholas Chan, who um, is the founder of GTM Social, and he helps businesses, founders, and marketing teams figure out how to acquire customers um, on LinkedIn, um, something that's very near and dear to our hearts at Letter Drop as well, something that we believe in. I first connected with him because we were talking about the same kinds of things um, on LinkedIn and, and uh, we believe in the same types of acquisition strategies. So very excited to have a conversation with him. Um, Nick, do you wanna uh, maybe introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your background and um, yeah, uh, how you started GTM Social and why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, happy to dive into that. Thanks for having me on. I think that the key thing that made me start this company was that I was part of three startups, hyper growth. They had between them, they had raised like hundreds of millions of dollars. And what I realized is that they were all making the same mistake. Uh, after they raise all this money, they say, we need to acquire customers. The best way to acquire customers is for us to hire a really big sales team, right? So they would hire a bunch of SDRs, account executives. And then what happened was after, you know, 12 months, they spent all this time hiring, uh, all their go-to-market hit a wall, right? Like they just couldn't get any customers. Their sales motion didn't scale. And after all that work, they just ended up firing all these account executives, wasting one year of their time and going back to their drawing board after burning, um, you know, a couple million dollars worth of cash. Right. And my take is that like, instead of, you know, this old playbook of, you know, to scale, we need to hire a big sales team. I think there's a new playbook coming in where companies are scaling and getting customers by doing great content marketing and distributing that content in the right place. And for me, where I see a big opportunity is LinkedIn. And that's what I help companies do. Build that content engine, distribute it on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I completely agree with that. I do think uh, you're seeing sales and marketing teams change dramatically, especially since we've kind of gone into a downturn. Uh, people are just hiring less. People are thinking about how they want to be more efficient. Um, and just throwing more headcount at the problem doesn't doesn't actually like solve anything for you. And so there is a place for your BDR, SDR, AEs, but it's really for trying to figure out how do you get more people to come to them? And then they're just essentially the human who closes the loop as opposed to them being the mechanism by which you do all kinds of customer acquisition. Um, so very aligned uh, with you on that. In terms of, um, you mentioned, you mentioned LinkedIn, right? So tell me a little bit more about how uh, the companies you previously worked at maybe should have thought about bringing customers to them and uh, maybe how LinkedIn ties into that. Yeah, for sure. So one thing at all the companies that I worked at that I saw was a really big opportunity that was missed was um, the fact that they were having tons of sales conversations um, with potential prospects. They were having tons of customer success conversations. And in those conversations, you would have you know, a member of, of the sales team uh, getting a, a really good pulse on the key problems that their customers were having or the prospects were having. And I work with so many really smart, like account executives, SDRs, CSMs, and they would provide so much value one-on-one -on -one in all these, in all of these calls. Uh, but I think the big missed opportunity for driving additional organic, um, sorry, driving additional inbound revenue was that instead of just saying these answers one-on-one, -on -one, the big opportunity would be to have the CSM uh, just post about the problems that they're talking about, post about uh, all the problem solving that they're doing. And, you know, my, my take is that like, by the time somebody, you know, hits your sales calls or hits a customer, uh, you know, QBR with a problem, there's a really high chance that like, you know, at least 50% of the market is asking the same questions. So one really tangible example of this was my last company is a company called Vidyard. And the whole idea behind Vidyard is that you would need, they create a tool that makes it easy for salespeople and, and revenue teams to record and then share videos. Um, so video messages like Loom. What I heard so often with our CSMs at really big accounts was that we would have like enterprise companies, they 
have already installed Vidyard, right? But they would ask, how should we use video to sell? They've already bought the solution, but they're asking us, oh, how should we use video to its full potential? Right. And then the CSM comes up with the plan. They give all these tips. Right. And I think like the next step for a lot of companies is how can you take a subject matter experts, like the one you already have on your team, such as these CSMs, and how can you help them create content that they're already like talking about in a one-on-one -on -one setting and then scale it, um, you know, do a channel like LinkedIn. And I think that would be the big opportunity for, you know, the companies that I worked at before and any companies that I work with in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Like we're totally aligned, um, on that as well. I think, I mean, people might call it fancy stuff like customer marketing or, or what have you, but really to your point, if one person's asking, uh, your team a question, it's very probable that the vast majority of people in your ICP probably have the same questions. And instead of just having that silo conversation in private, you should be sharing that information publicly. So other people who have that problem will organically uh, come to you and enter your pipeline. Um, and that's something that we do at Letter Drop as well. Like um, Matt, um, who runs our CS function, um, one of his primary objectives is to actually identify um, like things people are complaining about and work with our content marketer, Keelan, to actually turn that into uh, the, the right assets, identify happy people, take those snippets, yeah. turn that into case studies and videos and customer testimonials. And then we try to automate bits and pieces of that, um, using letter drop as well to like, kind of like pull those insights out of gong calls, et cetera. But yeah, totally agreed with you. Um, people should be answering those questions in public and bringing people, uh, bringing customers to themselves in terms of what do you think are the blockers for companies to do that? Why, why do you think companies yeah. are still in this old mindset of like, let's just throw money at um, scaling sales as opposed to thinking about, okay, how do we scale the insights and conversations that we already have into marketing? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the unfortunate answer is uh, for those that raise money, it's their VCs who are in this sort of outdated model uh, and telling them that, oh, you need to hire AEs and, and so on. And that's how you scale it up. But the the foundational reason is that I think it's it's an education problem right now. And right now, a lot of companies are basing their growth models on like old frameworks, right? So the, the two are like the lead waterfall, right? Which was popularized by Salesforce. It's the whole idea. You need like uh, a lot of SDRs. You use those to generate leads, those filter into meetings, those convert into demos. So I think that's one uh, framework that a lot of people have in mind. And then the second one is like the HubSpot inbound, um, write a lot of blog posts and use SEO um, to drive a lot of inbound traffic. So I think those are the two frameworks that people think a lot about and what I hear founders talk about and use as their mental model. And um, it's still, there's still a point where people need to uh, basically wrap their head around like, oh, okay, like um, it's no longer efficient to hire a lot of SDRs because cold email rates are not what they used to be. It's not as efficient as it used to be to just focus on SEO. It still works, right? But there's a lot more competition and there's a lot of like, yeah, I generated content out there. And right now the big fundamental shift, and I think a way to like frame what has changed in buyer behavior is that number one, if you're selling in B2B, uh, there's a lot more decision makers on the deal, right? So you need to be able to nurture and educate all the different like decision makers uh, in the deal that, you know, might not even make it to a sales call, right? And a great way to do that is with content distributed in a channel where they are spending time. So for me, like LinkedIn is a channel where like a lot of key decision makers and stakeholders spend a lot of time. Therefore, it's a good channel to focus on. Uh, I think the second thing is that this is actually like pretty commonly understood. Um, sorry, to, to backtrack. I think like a big problem right now is that when it comes to thinking about the return on investment on like organic and LinkedIn content, it's really hard for you to put numbers on it like you could on like SEO or this like lead waterfall, right? Like you can see like percentage conversion rates off meetings. You can see like, oh, okay, someone clicked this blog post and then clicked like request demo, right? 
Um, but this like attribution is a lot murkier for organic content and wrapping your head around like, okay, you will not see, like, it's going to be really hard for you to see like immediate requests, um, requests for demo requests for, uh, for your product. But, um, you, it's almost like trusting the process of if you share with the right customers, like you explain what your product does how it can help them and uh, what makes you different from your competitors and you show social proof in the right channels, then eventually they will, they will come to you. And uh, rambling a little bit here, but uh, one key thing I've been thinking about recently is that this is a process that organizations already do when it comes to the sales cycle, right? If you think about a long sales cycle in a B2B environment, it's, you know, I've seen deal cycles that can be like three months, six months, 12 months. And we never question the value of like the first few touch points in complex enterprise sales cycle, right? We don't go, oh, yo, Sally, the SDR, right? You just cold email this person, you got a reply, but it didn't turn into a sale. Like, why are you doing that? Why are you wasting your time, right? Like, um, we don't question the value of influencing and educating like a VP of marketing who may be purchasing software even if they don't sign immediately, right? Like we, we already assign value to that. And I think the big mindset shift is taking that like, okay, we do this across the sales cycle. How can we do this with content before they even come and have a meeting with us? So that's my roundabout way of saying like, what's wrong with the old model and what's different um, right now in the buying environment that makes this newer content model work? Yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, it, it does work. Um, there are lots of companies which are smart about that. You can see um, some companies like Gong, Metadata historically, um, Lavender, Hockey Stack, ourselves, we're yeah. trying to, um, we're really trying to figure out, okay, like how do we build like good organic inbound channels and how do we activate um, essentially employees because at the end of the day, people want to buy from people um, yeah. as well. And so I think it's definitely, it definitely works. It's very hard to get a company aligned on it uh, organizationally to make it work. Um, for us personally, like 64% of our inbound pipeline comes from LinkedIn, um, largely my LinkedIn, but our entire team is pitching in as well. And um, I've been doing this for a little over a year and a half. And I will tell you, it takes a lot of consistency and time to, to make it work. But in the past two weeks, um, I've had three CMOs at 500 plus companies just like DM me being like, hey, like, I just connected with them. I didn't do anything. I'm not outbounding to them. They just came to me and were like, Hey, like I saw your post or we saw something. Um, can we take a demo? Like I'm putting you in touch with the right person in my company. Um, and I think because it takes such a long time to see that value to your point with the 12 month enterprise cycle, yeah. sales cycle, people often give up in the early days where they're just like, Oh yeah, like I'm not seeing any results from this. Um, and so, and so they, um, and sort of they quit prematurely, um, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And to your point also, like attribution is much more challenging when you're not doing one-to-one, -one, but rather doing like one-to-many. And um, that's never going to go away. Like 100% attribution is just like impossible, straight up impossible. Um, like you can't have attribution over... I've been to like CMO dinners and people were shitting on um, Zoom info and, and praising Apollo. And that is not in Zoom Info's and Apollo's um, CRM in terms yep, of yep. attribution. It's just a dinner happening offline. Yep. And so 100% attribution is not possible. A lot of that is influenced through content, to, through these organic channels. Um, I think people can get directionally there. Like we made these investments and we've been doing these things in the same way that I say, like we've been doing this for the past year and a half. And I can, I can see the directional or correlated results from that. Um, or at least I can see like, some fraction of the touch points, right? You can see likes, you can see comments, you can see those inbound DMs, you can see who's visiting your site. Um, and so even if it's not one-to-one, -one, um, like an email sequence, um, you can at least be like, hey, like we're capturing like 30 of the touch points and that's good enough for me to know that this is working. In your mind, what do you need to say to a company or to an organization to help change their mind mindset to be like, hey, like this is how you should be thinking about things um, moving forward and what you're doing right now um, maybe is not going to scale because I think there are lots of companies which are like, okay, short term, I'm six months into this. Um, I am seeing a marginal improvement for, by throwing another headcount at it. How do you convince them like, Hey, like this is maybe another way you want to think about solving acquisition. Yeah, for sure. I think that's, a, sorry. Oh, hey, can you hear me still? 
Okay. Seems you can like just, we have a, yeah, I'll keep this part out, but you um, can keep speaking, by the way. Like, to, we'll take to care get of started it. on the, all right, sounds good. So question is, uh, how can, um, what does it take to start convincing companies of, uh, push like, like the, this is the model that we need to shift to. Is that correct? Um, so I think, first of all, that's a puzzle I'm still trying to figure out, but I think like what we can like where we can start is that we can agree that some things like aren't working like right off the bat, right? Like an example is if you are like, there are so many horror stories of all these startups who hired all these SDRs and, and, and account executives, they expanded their sales team in order to acquire customers. And then they ended up like not hitting their goals, having to fire all these people. I think it's really clear, like, okay, like this is not working. Right. Number one, like we should try a different model. The second thing in terms of how, how we can like make a business case like for this is that if like what I've been doing is sort of like building out ROI models for, for these companies and saying like, look, okay, uh, the immediate benefit of building your own audience is that you're going to get a lot of engagements and views that otherwise you would have to pay a lot of money for. Right. So. What I've seen like internally at companies I worked at is that marketing teams are happy to spend like hundreds of, of thousands of dollars on paid ads to deliver their content. And it's not delivering like any deals. Right. So there's already money that is being spent. Um, and if you think about, OK, we're paying, you know, X thousand of dollars to get in front of like 50,000 of our ideal customer um, and then what if you had just built an audience of 50 customers, you know, who trust you, um, who trust what you put out and when it comes, and if you spend time investing in that, a, you're going to save immediate money by not, by turning off paid ads. Um, and then number two, when, when it becomes time, like, you know, three months, four months down the line, when you've built trust, you built awareness, um, you know, and they need to purchase a solution, uh, you know, in your ROI model, you can just model out like, okay, you know, let's say we like, let's very conservatively think that in six months we can get like one, two or three deals from this, then this will be worth our time. Right. And I think like, that's a good time frame to evaluate like a, a content initiative like this, um, to start seeing like progress. And I also think that's a good way to justify the short term, like investment. Um, you know, if you're going to get 50 views, how much would you pay for that versus just building your own audience? Yeah. And uh, I have some thoughts on that. Um, and don't get me wrong. I'm on your side uh, over here. I think in terms of efficient growth, this is what companies need to be doing. Um, I'm just sharing the devil's advocate position that I've heard right. from people um, just to like, like have like a, a pretty uh, candid conversation about like why people do the things that they do. Right. Um, a, I was, I was part of, uh, I'm part of this community called, called Pavilion. I saw some people there talking about, Hey, like there's all this talk about Chris Walker's like dark social funnel, all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Here's the reality over the past five years, we just dumped a ton of money into paid acquisition. And we took this company from like series A to series C, series D, and it worked. I'm not saying it was effect like efficient but it sure as hell worked and we got to the next stage essentially. And so I think a lot of people's pushback there is the claim that like, Hey, it did historically work, um, yeah. essentially. Um, and then the second thing, I think the reason why people do this is because, um, when you, a CMOs or VPs of marketing of all of the executive positions, they have the shortest tenure, um, yeah. just, just historically speaking. And so, um, for whatever reason, they have to show results fairly quickly. And so the patience required and the long-term thinking required to execute on some of these programs that we're talking about, um, just kind of like fall outside of mm -hmm. what they could tangibly actually do. And so what's easy or cheap, like money is cheap, actually, like I can just dump money into paid, paid and yep. scale it like on day one. Um, uh, it's very expensive, but at, at the very very least, I can start showing some sorts of results. Uh, the organic thing, I can't, it, it takes time to your point, even if you put it down on the schedule and, and some of those VPs just don't think that they have that kind of, uh, time essentially also to your point, And this is where like folks like you also come in, it's a talent problem, right? 
Um, it's easier to solve a problem with money to just be like, I'm going to just spend money on ads than to find the right talent that can actually execute on a great organic program. Like you just mentioned, because it does require somebody who's willing to do the research, listen, understand customers, do like good product marketing before you can do a good content marketing essentially. Right. And so that's, that's kind of like my take on like why, why people do the things that they, they do. One is like, it's historically worked to like, it's just easier for them to like pay for it. And maybe this worked until last year, but we're in a different macro environment right now. And so I do think your point, it's good timing for people to rethink what they're doing because those old playbooks maybe worked in, in sort of like, uh, frothy zero interest rate phenomenon yeah. times and they don't work today anymore yeah yeah like two two things i i really want to comment on that uh the, the first is the to do this well it's a talent problem like you need to have good product marketing before you can have good content marketing and like to be really specific like you need to be have like a very strong point of view on like how your customers should solve problems what makes you different right and, and like in my opinion use cases are really important also right so before you can do good content marketing you really really need to have great product marketing otherwise you're just going to be like turning your wheels you can post like every day and it's not gonna it's not gonna stick and land the second thing is like um yeah, like Chris Walker can be like really like controversial sometimes. And and um, for those who don't know, his whole dark social playbook is like, yeah, like invest in organic content um, and so on. Here's the thing, look, Chris Walker also runs paid ads. Like if you look at all his case studies, he runs a lot of paid ads, but it's just how he runs those paid ads is a little bit different, right? Like the old model of running paid ads is like, oh, like let's drive people towards webinars, right? Let's drive people to towards like a sales form. Um, let's drive people towards like an ebook or something like that. And um, what he does is like, he, he almost like flips the model and he goes, okay, before we run paid ads, let's test a lot of messaging and test a lot of content first um, via, you know, organic, right? Uh, we'll create a lot of content, post it on the right, like communities, post it on the right social channels and see what resonates the most, right? Like that's, that's step number one. And then he runs the playbook of, okay, we're going to use paid ads and we're not going to drive toward like sales forms or anything, but we're going to push this message. We're going to push, um, you know, pick the winners of our organic content and then guarantee that it gets distributed uh, with paid ads. Right. So like, I think that's, you know, I'm not a paid ads expert, but like if I were the CMO, right, like I think this is a much more um, high likelihood chance you're going to see a return on your investment if this is how you approach paid ads and yeah you're right like we are in a completely different environment right now um you know the way you phrase it is like oh yeah like we raised one round we spent enough on paid ads to get to our next like 50 million round people aren't giving 50 million dollars out anymore um to for you to have that room to run that amount of paid ads right like um, so if you don't have that cash or capital available um i feel like then you just have to prepare to explore other channels that don't require you spending like thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on paid ads and hoping it works right so that's my take absolutely and to give you some perspective um at letter drop we've just been doing organic acquisition all the way till probably last october or so and then we spent about three and a half months um, actually thinking a little bit more about our paid strategy. Uh, and basically the only thing which even had any sort of lift at our stage was retargeting. That is people are already interested in what yep. you're doing and you're just reminding them of how much the reminding works, like were they going to buy anyway? Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is um, LinkedIn thought leadership ads showed a little bit of lift as well. It's just like to your point with Chris Walker, find things which already work organically and then actually scale them, right? Instead of trying to just like throw money to get people in the door first, find something that's already working and then spend money to scale it. I tell Ryan, our BDR about this. I say like, hey, get the messaging right. Get like yep. the, the fundamentals right first, because otherwise if you just like start dumping in tons of emails in Apollo and scaling this up, you're just going to simply suck at scale and have bad results. The same thing applies to paid. If you take like bad messaging, bad copy and bad creative and or bad content and try to scale it up um, via paid, you're just like wasting your time and money. You're just sucking at scale. So totally agreed on that. In terms of, okay, let's say we've gotten a company, we've talked to a VP, we've talked to a CMO, we've, we've, they're bought in. They're like, hey, like, yes, like I get it. I understand why I need yep. to do this. I understand why we need to change 
the way we operate, what would you say are the sort of like steps that they need to take, like, like a uh, crawl, walk, run in order for them to get some sort of motion going? Yep. Uh, so finally, we got someone interested. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the first thing uh, is we need like the sort of like base ingredients, right? And like those base ingredients are what I mentioned before. We need to have great product marketing in place and being even more specific, I think a great place for companies to start is number one, if you don't have great case studies, like I think that you should invest some time in creating great case studies and social proof. And that's a really you know important asset to have uh, that you can then turn into a lot of, um, a, a lot of content um, that drives inbound revenue. The second thing is I think it's important to sit down with the leadership team and agree on like a perspective or point of view that you want to, um, that you want to push, right? And ideally that perspective or point of view ties into your core product, right? So once you have these base ingredients, you have some social proof, you have your perspective and point of view, then you can start of like, start building up from there, right? And where I would go next is, uh, Hopefully you're recording all your sales calls. Um, and then what you can do is you can review all your sales calls and you can start building a content roadmap by reviewing like questions that people are asking, uh, reviewing points of like excitement, right? Like when you say a certain thing, what gets people excited and like what makes them perk up? That's another great like form um, of, of content to, to build. Um, so it's questions, objections, and confusion was another thing to look out for in these sales calls, right? So. What happened before when I used to review sales calls is that like, I would notice like confusion, like, oh, so like, what does your product really do? Right. Or you, you say your pitch and it doesn't quite land and they're like, oh, so, you know, what do you actually mean? Um, so I think that if there's confusion, you can also build content around there. So, um, now we have case studies and social proof. We have a strong point of view. Uh, we sit down, we built a content roadmap, uh, across like all the important topics that we are guaranteed to resonate with our customers, I think the final like element or ingredient um, is to think about how you can differentiate and, and talk about your product and show your product in action. Because you can do general education, you can build content around your customers' questions and their confusion points. But ultimately the goal is that we need to uh, you know, drive uh, interest in our product and the problems that it solves. Um, so some good ways of doing this is thinking about, okay, like, uh, let's look back at our case studies, right? How do we map a feature, um, that, that we launched to, uh, specific outcomes? What features do our customers want to see? Because, you know, we're selling software. It's, it's complex, right? It is uh, hard to understand sometimes. So, uh, the final like touch on this content strategy is thinking about how can we show the product in action and showing it, solving the problems. Um, so I think these are all the base ingredients. These are all really important. And then you take all this information and you package it and think, okay, like how can I, as a, you know, solo marketer on a team or it's a very lean marketing team, come up with, uh, an engine to create content. And one of the best ways to do this, in my opinion, is that, um, there are different formats, but the best one is like finding a recurring theme or a current content format that you can execute every single week um, with your eyes closed that will be valuable to your customers that will uh, be of interest. And uh, two examples really come to mind. The first is Hockey Stack. Um, they do, a, a, you know, they're reporting platform attribution, helping marketers with data. And one thing they do is like a series on a recurring basis called, can you dashboard this? Right. And it's just something that they can do like every month, right. They have their account executives sit down and show like, oh yeah, you know, like normally this would take hours, but in hockey stack, like here's how you build this dashboard and here's um, what you can report on and all the business use cases. That's, that's a great example. Another example of a recurring content format that, you know, takes these base ingredients and packages it really nicely for content is there's a FinTech company called Sardine and what they do is that their founder every week, him and his team, um, because it, it definitely takes a team to put this together. He goes, Hey, um, actually backtracking what they solve for their customers is uh, fraud, right? So how can we prevent fraud? How can we improve compliance? And every week he releases a very long, uh, text post on LinkedIn called new fraud just dropped. 
right? So what is the fraud? What is the one, two, three, four, five of how it's executed, right? And, and then how can you prevent it? And that's an example of a recurring content format that takes all these foundational ingredients um, and then melds it into one recurring content format. And then at the very end, he can talk about his product, right? He talks about, oh, like this is our approach to solving fraud. Uh, you need to use data to solve this, to get ahead of it. And here's what makes us you know, different from other providers, right? But um, it's insightful to all his uh, potential customers. It's, I find it interesting. I'm not even in FinTech, right? And um, I think that would be like my playbook for companies looking to execute this strategy um, and build like a consistent stream of content. Amazing. Yeah, I, I really like the trying to find some sort of like series or something which relates to you solving problems actually for your customers in the way that you pointed out what Sardine and Hockey Stack do. Um, definitely something we've been thinking about ourselves and I'm trying to figure out with our CS, yeah. um, uh, lead trying to figure out like, do we just like help companies, uh, or like showcase, like how we're helping companies letter drop, but really making it more about like solving their problems. I love that. Um, awesome. In terms of we've, let's say we've executed all this stuff. How do we know if it's working or if we're barking up the wrong tree? Like, how do we know if uh, this is actually worthwhile and if this investment is worth it? Because at the end of the day, your CEO and the board are going to be like, okay, like, how are we allocating capital? Like, what are we yep. doing in terms of go to market over here? Um, you essentially took away um, both time and money from us hiring like the other SDRs. So yep. I want you to show me, show, 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 show me that this is actually worthwhile. Yep, for sure. So I think that the way you can uh, sort of start tracking the, the impact uh, and the right metric is the inbound conversations that you're having. And then for your like, you know, if you have a sales form on your website, you can just, um, you know, add a simple field that goes like, oh, how did you hear about us? Right. And then track and categorize it by like, okay, like content initiative, LinkedIn, right. Um, or like, you know, somebody referred us to you and that somebody isn't already like an existing customer. Right. Um, and if you implement, like, that's a great way to just start tracking and showing the ROI, especially in the early stage. And then you can like, you know, get more sophisticated about it with whatever software you need to. But uh, if you're just getting started, right, um, just tracking the inbound conversations that, that are coming in and adding that field on your form uh, can show you a lot of um, data in terms of like how your customers are coming in. Because I feel like this gets talked a lot about a lot, um, but uh, I saw this like, firsthand at, at my company um, called Convictional uh, a, a year ago, we assumed that a lot of brands were finding us through Google, through organic search, right? So at first we were like, oh, like we need to invest more in SEO. This is like the top performing channel. But we added this, this, this question on our form and how did you hear about us? And we realized like, oh, these customers coming in, turns out that a lot of them are actually just uh, hearing about us through word of mouth, right? Like this is um, so it's important to set up like the right tracking and like, this is the easiest way to set up tracking. Right yeah. I tell every single marketing team that if you don't, and if you, you need, whether you're self-serve or whether you, um, do demos, you need to have a, how do you hear about us form and perhaps even potentially make it mandatory. Um, the second thing I would say is to not use a drop down over there, make it free yep. form so that people can actually report, um, what they want, what they think. To your point, I think there's like at Convictional, right? Maybe people were just Googling Convictional and then they show up on your site. And so that's essentially just a branded search, um, yeah. which shows up from Google, but not, it's not actually truly from Google. It's word of mouth. Yeah. Um, the second thing is if anything were coming from SEO, you would actually understand like what they were searching for, um, as opposed to just being like, oh yeah, like I, yeah, it's yeah, SEO, yeah. but like amongst our 300 pages, I don't know which ones were contributing towards that. So yeah, that's, that's definitely something that's super important. Amazing. So I, I think, um, this was a really good conversation, Nick, um, really appreciate you taking the time to, to chat about, uh, stuff. And, uh, I think the last thing is, um, uh, just like giving people a way to reach you. So what's the best way for any of our listeners to, uh, reach out to you if they are starting to think about. Um, how to go to market organically. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, really simple. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I, my company is called GTM Social. Go to Market Social, uh, and you'll be able to find me from there. And yeah, like if you want to, you know, jam on ideas, right? Like help get help with setting up your strategy. Like always happy to, you know, for free. Just give my thoughts, share my thoughts, and and help companies out there. Absolutely. Well, it was a pleasure having you, Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Barthi.